Hi, welcome to the Sankofa Pan African series. Our guest today is Emmanuel Kulu Jr., who is a career social worker with a passion for history and the creative arts. He's of Cameroonian descent. I, Black Pharaoh, uh, is Emmanuel, uh, Emmanuel Kulu's novel, is a fast paced Egyptian story. It is the untold story of destiny, triumph, and epic battles based on the historical rise of the Queen Pharaoh, Hatshepsut, and the expansionist warrior Pharaoh. Now, a prophecy is given to, the, to, to a sorcerer through a dream about the impending birth of a child that would become a mighty conqueror of nations. He will be known as the Black Pharaoh. His birth, however, will be darkened by betrayal, deceit, and eminent death, uh, eminent death of a royal figure. Against all odds, his majesty will rise and face the greatest obstacles that an Egyptian ruler ever had to contend with. So hungry for more? First, take a minute to click on your subscribe uh, button if you've not yet done so before we meet Emmanuel Kulu, the author of this scintillating novel. Really great to have you here, Emmanuel Kulu Jr. Yes, yes. Please tell us a bit more about yourself. I know you're of Cameroonian descent based in the yes. U.S., Mm -hmm. Tell us a bit more about yourself. Yes, my father uh, is from Cameroon. He played for the Indomitable Lions, the greatest soccer team of all time in Africa. <laughs> <laughs> um, and my mother, she is actually African-American. So I share in the pain and joy of being both an African and an African-American. Um, so um, my father, when he was married to my mother, he always trained me on the great history of my ancient African royalty family. Um, my father is part of the Bantu speakers who are directly connected to the Zulu tribe. So when you hear the name Kulu, it is basically derived from Zulu. Oh, wow. So uh, we have great history when it comes to our ancestry and our lineage. So as I grew up, I really wanted to be that bridge between the African-Americans and the Africans, because there are differences between us in the diaspora. And to let each other know, to feel sympathy and pain and empathy for our brothers and sisters abroad for the different things that they, they faced. Awesome, awesome. And I understand that before writing, you had some experience with, uh, with acting. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a bit about, about that. I was also into, I was a music producer for 15 years in the wow. music industry. I also was in The First Purge and Bug Love, which was a 24-hour film. I was also casted for uh, American Werewolf that didn't come out, but I was uh, still casted for it um, to be a part of that film. But yes, acting was a brief part of my career. I was more into film writing. I actually wrote a film uh, called The Assassination of Shaka Zulu. And we ran into some copyright issues in regards to the 1986 Shaka Zulu film. Mm. So we kind of had to table that, but it's a project I do want to get back to. But that led me into writing about ancient Africa, um, writing about Shaka. You're, you've also done a lot of research into, into history. So um, that probably brings me to this question, why a historical novel? Well, historical novel, because the miseducation of African history has dominated through Eurocentrism and white supremacy. Mm -hmm. Therefore, we are not used to seeing Africans tell African stories. It's always someone other than Africans. And that didn't sit right with me, sister. Um, I really wanted to, to bring forth those beautiful stories, not always hear about slavery and what happened in transatlantic slave trade, what about Africa in its glory? What about our great queens like Queen Imani Reyes, uh, Queen Hapshetsu, 
What about Shaka, Tutmosis, Akmosa, these, these great pharaohs? What about the Songhai kingdom? What about Abensinya and Aksum? All of these, the great Zimbabwe, Benin, all of these mm-hmm. kingdoms that I could pick from. I decided to go with Egypt because Egypt was the monarch of civilization. Mm. You talk about the Greeks and the Romans, how much they learned from Egypt. I felt, okay, the Egyptians were black African people, despite how it has been whitewashed or Eurocentrized throughout history. This fact needs to come to the forefront. So that's what led me into writing about ancient African history. And then just talking about the fact that our stories need to be told by us. I mean, bringing it back to your, the issue you've had with your assassination of the Shaka Zulu movie that you've had to table because that Shaka Zulu film where you ran into copyright issues with was not done by Africans. Exactly. So exactly. the story of Shaka Zulu, not done from an African perspective. Mm-hmm. So, we re- I really hope you're able to get back to that someday. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. We're, we're working on it. We will do it after we finish Black Pharaoh. Um, Black Pharaoh, again, it's very important to reestablish Egypt back to Africa. Mm. Because what a lot of scholars tried to do in the past, in the 1900s, was try to separate Egypt from Africa. Even till now, it's still being done. Oh yes, oh yes. They, they attempt, yes. you know, they 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 say, oh, there's this claim that the DNA of a uh, modern Egyptians is so different from DNA mm-hmm. of uh, other um, exactly. Saharan African. But what mm-hmm. they do not factor in is that yes. Egypt had various waves of mm-hmm. migrations, yes. and over centuries, it has become so mixed that it is not surprising if right. modern Egyptians share a lot of DNA with non, you know, with non African. But yes. that does not take away from the fact that the original Egyptians, the ones in charge of the great ancient civilizations, were Africans yeah, from- Black Africans. From, from yeah, places like Somalia, mm-hmm. you know, they moved upwards, they moved yes. you know, upwards into Egypt and made those civilizations. And there is evidence, you know, Hard evidence. in, yes, there are archeological evidence, you know, to prove it. Mm-hmm. Okay, so please, I can't wait. I'm sure our viewers are, you know, are anxious to hear you read an excerpt from your novel, mm-hmm. I, Black, uh, Black Pharaoh. And sister, I also wanted to mention the selection of who the main characters of the book were. I chose Hapshetsu because we hear so much about Nefertiti, which was a great queen of Egypt. We hear so much about Cleopatra, um, which could connect to ancient Greece, obviously. Mm -hmm. But we don't hear about Hatshetsu, who ruled Egypt for 20 to 25 years. This was uh, an African queen who had the longest stint run as the absolute ruler. Mm -hmm. And also, I wrote about Tutmosis II, who was the greatest conqueror. In comparison to somebody like Shaka Zulu, I mean, Shaka was the great conqueror of the South and Tutmosis was the great conqueror of Northern Africa who conquered all the way up into the Black Seas and as far South as Nubia. So I wanted to tell this story about great African, this great African queen and this great African conqueror. So, and combine those stories and, and bring it to the forefront. And what is <laughs> I, 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 such an interesting read. Uh, I I loved you know I loved every bit of it. Thank you. Uh, I, I am so I'm, I'm very very sure that uh, readers who pick it up will not regret doing so. So please share and accept with us. Yes, yes. <laughs> I'm I'm just glad that I'm very happy that people can take a glimpse into ancient Africa from an African perspective when we're talking about the foods that. Uh, Egyptians ate. We're talking about import export trade with other African nations. We're talking a little bit about war. We're talking about conflict with the Asiatics. 
we're talking about also there's um there's romance there's there's romance yes there's romance i mean we have to see these egyptian people sometimes we look at them as god figures but we forget they were human beings Mm -hmm. you know they made mistakes they made bad choices sometimes they you know, they lived somewhat like regular human beings just behind the palace. Human beings. <laughs> right, right. Even though they, 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 when they died, they became deified, or even during their lifetimes, because of who they were, you know, people tended to, to deify them, you know, but they were human beings. Exactly. <laughs> and also in the book is the connection to the biblical studies. Usually when you study Egyptology, and I'm sure you notice yourself, they try to separate the Bible, which the Bible actually validates a lot of the Black African, um, uh, Black African origins of ancient Egypt. It always groups Ethiopia and Egypt and Cush into the sons of Ham. So we know this to be very clear. And also there's a major connection between the Israelites and the Egyptians as well through biblical history. Joseph had... Egyptian wives. His brothers had Egyptian wives. You know, Moses took a Cushite wife. So clearly, these uh, Israelites, even though many may consider them to be Afro-Asiatic, mixed with African people throughout their history. Mm. Can we have your excerpt? Can we? Can you read to us? Yes. The wrath of the queen comes to Nubia. In the cold on the rainy evening, Hapshetsu rode behind the supreme forces in a golden war chariot as they made way to Nubia. Hapshetsu dispatched a messenger to the Nubian camp with deceptive news. Her scheme intended to make them believe Egypt had withdrawn their forces from the battle. In vain glory and unbeknownst to them, she planned to storm the city with relentless wrath. One Nubian rebel general stood up after they heard the news. The Chemites withdrew their campaign. The cowards must have realized they could not defeat us. Tomorrow, we go to commit to overthrow and remove their fell. Once again, the Nubians shall rule Kemet and the rest of the world. A great day this is, men. Let us celebrate, for tomorrow brings the dawn of a new era. The Nubian military chanted great cheers and celebrated until dusk. The men enjoyed themselves. They ate, drank, danced, and sang praises of victory, unaware of Hapshetsut's diabolical plan. She sent two spies ahead of her to report the right time to strike. From a distance off, Hapshetsut and the Supreme Forces surrounded the Nubian camp, unnoticed they awaited the return of the two spies. Hapshetsu's army gathered around her. On this day, we shall take no prisoners, destroy everyone and show no mercy. As you have heard, their plan is to storm upon Kemet tomorrow. We must eliminate them and end this tonight. Your queen is with you. Fight for your brothers and leave none of our own behind. Amun Ra is with me. General Akto prepared the ranks for battle and awaited Hapshetsu's command to attack. The two spies returned breathless. The Nubians are in deep into their deep celebration, said one of the spies. They are blind to our presence, great queen. The second spy stepped forward. Their soldiers are quite drunk in celebration. At your command, great queen, now is the time to strike. The rain calmed after intermittent downpours. Ready for battle, Hapshetsu's 100,000 troops remained erect and silent in battle formations. Hapshetsu sat rigid but elegant, high on her horse. She rode back and forth in the front of her brigade from one end to the other and expected her men. Unsettled by these unfamiliar battle conditions, she quieted her mind in meditation to Amun Ra. The power of Amun-Ra came upon the the queen with a strong wind, which only she felt. His voice also came to her, which only she heard. I have delivered the Nubians into your hand. On this day, you shall become the mightiest of all queens of Kemet. She unlatched her eyes and she was strengthened and renewed. Her anxieties transformed into ambition, 
ready for battle. She drew her sword, attack, like a meteorite. The Egyptian supreme forces crashed down on the intoxicated Nubians from the hills. The Nubians stirred as, stirred as loud chants surrounded them in, on every side. Massive rum, rumblings vibrated the ground towards them. The quake shook louder and closer by the second. The supreme forces came upon the Nubians with sudden fierceness. Unprepared and unarmed, the Nubian soldiers scrambled to fight with fire and stones. Queen Habshetsu, protected by General Octo, used hand and ground tactics against the Nubian warriors and their general. Habshetsu lashed the rebels with her golden whip as she rode by them. Glass shards on the whip sliced through the enemy's flesh with each lash. Octo eliminated, eliminated all in his path with his bow and arrow. Within an hour, the Nubians were defeated. Great was the loss of life. The enemy had many casualties. Survivors retreated to the safe grounds. The Egyptians' forces ecstatic. The remaining enemies had fled the scene, hailed their queen for her bravery. Habshetsu, with pride and self-exaltation, received the praise and honor of a true pharaoh. Though the queen was covered in Nubian blood, she was overjoyed to be considered a warlord by the supreme forces. Her army shouted and chanted, Queen Pharaoh, Queen Pharaoh, for the great victory. The queen showed great posture and humility as she allowed each, of, each soldier to kiss her hand in respect. As they raided the Nubian camps, General Octo found large sacks of wine, which he brought back to his men to salute the queen. He said, great queen, tonight we honor you for this great victory as you stood in the place of our Pharaoh and fought amongst men to defend Kemet. Your plan was flawless. We have finally eradicated the Nubians. This discussion will be continued in the next episode. Thank you for watching don't forget to subscribe to the Sankofa Pan-African series channel, like our videos, and please share them with your contacts.